I'm Linda Baker, the Learning Director for the Center for Research and Education on Violence Against Women and Children. On behalf of the Knowledge Hub team, welcome to our research briefing. Nato Wehowin, an artistic and cultural program for Indigenous women who have experienced intimate partner violence. The presenters will speak for up to 15 minutes. Please enter comments or questions for the presenters into slido.com and use the code 7423. This code will be shown on the slides for your reference throughout the presentation. During the last five minutes of our research briefing, I will present some of your questions to our presenters for their response. The link to the presentation slides was emailed to you earlier this morning. Now I'm delighted to introduce our speakers. Lori Dietz was the domestic violence advocate for the Moose Jaw Natawayoin group. Lori came to the group as a frontline worker at the Moose Jaw Transition House and as the chair of the Waccamaw Aboriginal Community Association. Crystal Giesbrecht is the Director of Research and Communications at PAS, the Provincial Association of Transition Houses and Services in Saskatchewan. Crystal's role in Natawayawin included project management, research coordination, and data analysis. Lori and Crystal, welcome. Thank you, Linda. My name is Crystal Giesbrecht, and I will briefly share some of the background about our project before Laurie explains the content of the program. Nathawehoen means the art of self-healing in Cree. It is a 13-week, culturally relevant, holistic, and trauma and violence-informed group for Indigenous women who've experienced intimate partner violence. Women get together one evening per week to engage in activities that are cultural and creative and in and intended to build resilience, cultural connection, and social support networks. Natawehoen was supported by the Public Health Agency of Canada. PATHS is the member association for domestic violence shelters and services in Saskatchewan. We chose to undertake this project with the support of our member agencies and our partners with the goal of designing an intervention for Indigenous women who'd experienced intimate partner violence. One of the reasons that the group felt that this was so important is because Indigenous women comprise 16% of women in Saskatchewan, but 80% of women who access our domestic violence shelters are Indigenous. The program was designed and piloted in Moose Jaw, we then ran the group three times in three different communities, Prince Albert, Regina, and Moose Jaw, Saskatchewan. These communities are different in terms of being larger and smaller urban centers, northern and southern locations in the province, and in terms of having different opportunities for access to culture. The women who participated in Natawehoen also participated in research to help evaluate the effectiveness of the group for Indigenous women who've experienced violence and trauma. The goal of all of this was to be able to share a program manual that others could use to implement a program like Natawehoen in their communities and to provide research results to confirm that this is in fact helpful for Indigenous survivors. Now I'll pass it to Lori to speak about the content and the delivery of the program. Thank you. Natawehoen comes together with the support of many incredible team members, as you see here. Some of the roles can be combined with others. For example, food preparation can easily be prepared by almost anyone who likes to cook. Three key roles that we found need to be present at each meeting were the knowledge keeper, who in Moose Jaw was the lead facilitator. The Knowledge Keeper has cultural knowledge of traditional artwork, traditional teachings, and traditional medicine used for self-care. The Elder. Our Elder was a supporting role. She usually opened our sessions in prayer. She was av available when the women needed to talk. The Domestic Violence Advocate was the logistical genius. My job was to do intakes with the women and facilitate the research circles. I arranged all transportation and child care for the women throughout the program. I also referred the women to outside agency when more support was needed. 
The most important part of the job is addressing barriers for the women. Every woman came with their own unique barriers. Having childcare and transportation available was crucial. However, it is important for program managers to understand that each family may need something different. A woman with four plus children will find it easier for childcare in her home rather than gathering all her children up to be in group on time when it's minus 30 outside. Each woman will have different, different needs and that's okay. Food, not surprisingly, is a huge aspect to this program. Food insecurity, food insecurity is a huge barrier for many Indigenous families. Moose meat stew with the remains of Barb's garden vegetables was much needed during the winter months when nutrient-rich food is not easily accessible. Having the role of food preparer being filled by someone who understands food insecurity issues will get you farther rather than someone who just has food available. What a typical class look like. Women would often arrive early to help set up, visit, and eat. Traditional tea was always made available, usually muskeg, but we got to know other traditional teas. Class started promptly at six. We would open the circle with prayer and teachings, followed by a check-in. Longer teachings, longer teachings would happen within the first six weeks of class. The next three to four, the next three to four weeks, the women would want to get to work on their projects as they would be nearing completion. Many women worked on their projects at home. Most women finished their projects, some did not, they took their time, they were okay with that. In some groups we picked large projects, in some we had smaller ones. Projects for the Moose Jaw group included loomed belts, pipe bags, skirts, and baby moccasins. Some favorite activities and teachings were the foot baths and making salves. Almost everything used were natural products handpicked by Barb. Each week during circle check-in, the women shared whatever was on their mind and how their week had been. We got to know each other well, and we were fortunate in Moose Jaw to build a close group of women that still interacts to this day. At the end of our 12 weeks, each group ended with their 12-week research, followed by a 13-week feast. This was a mixed method study where we collected responses to a number of quantitative measures at intake. Women completed those again at the end of the group and one year later post completion. Since we were researching the intervention, we used the 12th week of the program for data collection and the women came back together on the 13th week for a feast and wrap up. We had women fill out questionnaires related to their experience of abuse and trauma symptoms at intake. The quantitative measures that were repeated at the three time points included two measures of challenges, depression and anxiety, and six measures of strengths, including quality of life, personal and interpersonal agency, resilience, connectedness, and post-traumatic growth. For a quantitative analysis, we use multi-level modeling to look at changes in women's self-assessments on the different measures at the three time points, intake, end of group, and one year post. We saw significant increases in participants' self-reported sense of personal agency, resilience, connectedness, and post-traumatic growth, as well as two subscales on the post-traumatic growth inventory, the new possibilities and spiritual change subscales, we also saw statistically significant decreases in depression and anxiety reported by the women from when they began Natawehuin to when follow-up data was collected. In focus groups, which were, connect, were conducted like a sharing circle at the end of the group and then also one year later, we inquired how women felt about their emotional, spiritual, mental, and physical health and well-being before and after attending Natawehuin. On the slide are some of the themes relating to positive changes that women noticed regarding various dimensions of their health and well-being. Overall, participants reported feeling happier and experiencing a more positive outlook. They gave examples that demonstrated ways in which they were resilient. They expressed an improved sense of balance and clarity in their lives and reported improved self-care practices and management of their daily routines. 
women continue to engage in cultural and creative activities using the skills and teachings from the group on their own afterward. Women also spoke of passing what they learned on to their children and of the positive impact that Natawehoan had on their parenting. Now, Lori can speak about what has been happening in her community since being part of Natawehoan. We have been able to establish a core group of women in Moose Jaw who want to continue beating and healing. The women have gone on to do even bigger projects like the one seen here. This was part of a project with the Waccamo Aboriginal Community, Asso Community Association. This project became the women's first art opening, the Waka Women's Cape Project. We continued on and opened again at the Moose Jaw Museum and Art Gallery with the Dancing Spirit in Isolation, which was the woman's personal interpretation of their own beaded jingle dress dancer. And hopefully opening soon, we will have the Women's Medicine Bag exhibit. As a group, we have kept some of the most important pieces in place, our teachings with Barb, food, and support from one another. And to wrap up our presentation is a slide of more of the women's creations. Here we see two large collaborative paintings that were made by the women participants, also a beaded bag and, a, and an example of some of the loom work that was made during Natawe Hoan. Here is our contact information the program manual and facilitator's guide, as well as some short reports about the project will be available here. You can also send me an email if you'd like to be notified when we post new pieces on our website. Thank you, Lori and Crystal. And I'd like to just move right into questions if that's okay. And I'd like to start with a question for you, Lori. You mentioned that women in the group remain connected even after the group was over. Can you expand on that and share some of the ways in which that connection was fostered and maintained? Um, we were fortunate in that I come in as the chair of the Waccamaw Aboriginal Community Association. So seeing the need, I was able to establish some funding to continue the beating. Uh, we had family nights at Waka, so we kept in close contact because the women uh, wanted uh, culture and tradition so badly. So even those women have gone on to help us on our board of Waka doing powwows and round dances and things like that. So we have been able to keep our connection really close. So that's definitely been a benefit for us. Mm -hmm. And Crystal, I mean, the research findings are really quite amazing. They're so positive. And I just wondered if you could expand a little bit about what you mean by and how you measure post-traumatic growth. Yes, absolutely. So that was measured with a validated quantitative scale. It's called the post-traumatic growth inventory. This tool measures post-traumatic growth overall, as well as a number of subscales related to different facets of growth. So women filled that out before they began and then at the end of the group and afterwards so that we could compare and see those changes. It's also important to note that the research portion was completely optional. Women were able to engage in the intervention without being part of the research, but all women did choose to be part of the research and we received positive feedback on that as well. Mm -hmm. I, there's um, definitely comments about congratulations on this amazing project. And we want to ask both of you, if you could change anything about this project, what would it be looking back? Lori, can we start with you? For me, for me, it would be bigger and more inclusive of all our families. I mentioned childcare. And in Worcester, we had a bit of a struggle with childcare, finding an appropriate. And I would really like to see someone come in, like our older youth, our early 20s, uh, teaching Indigenous teachings to our children. So it wouldn't just be growing and healing for a woman. It would be growing and healing for all parts of our family. So, you know, all the family could come and get teachings and do artwork or do different things. So it would be all inclusive. Mm, okay, so not just one member of the family, even though that learning was passed on, it would be the whole family. 
And Crystal, what about for you, if you could change anything about this project? I don't think I would change anything, but it's been it's been a long process. We started planning this late in 2015, began the project officially in 2016. So there has been a ton of learning for myself and our organization and all of our team members. So I think we could have if I would have known things, maybe I could have been a more efficient manager of some of the pieces. But overall, we're just so pleased with how it turned out. Building on what Lori said, though, the scope of this project was to develop and research an intervention specifically for women. I think there is definitely an opportunity to branch out. And while we had the child care available for children, doing more programming with with children would be another step. And, and that would be something that we would like like to see others take on, perhaps. I think that's a really important future direction. Thank you. One of the things that really stands out, both in your presentation and, and your findings, is the importance of food. And you mentioned, Lori, food insecurity. But I have a feeling there's more to it than um, because there is food insecurity, that that's why it was important. And I just wondered if you could speak to the significance of food in terms of this project. Yeah, it it's food insecurity. We know that's an issue for many people in, in, in Canada dealing with property, but it's the type of food that you're eating. It's having the traditional food available. It's understanding the healing property of those of those food and of course the bigger aspect of food in general is just everyone coming together when we come together to eat like everyone would be barreling in at different times the kids would come and be grabbing plates and we'd all sit in a big table and eat together and visit and that's been a very big part of everything we've done it's not just having us prepare food there was times when people would bring food and just the honor that people would take on to come feed one another and do that as a group it was it was really it was really neat to see mm -hmm. and linda on this relates to the question of what we would have changed actually when we piloted natawehoan we had not planned for that food comport component, which in hindsight sounds very silly now, but we got feedback from women once the first set of the three groups had started that food was something they needed. So thankfully, working with such a great funder, we were able to provide that. And it looked a little different in the three communities. In some communities, we were able to have a designated person who cooked and brought those food, the food in. In others, we were ordering the food from local restaurants, or like Lori said, team members were cooking and bringing it. So it looked a bit different everywhere. But two learnings are that you need to be flexible and be able to adapt and provide things to reduce barriers and make it easier for people to attend. Also that food builds community. And number three is that people really appreciated the home cooked food most of all. And if there's any way to have team members who are able to do that, it really adds. Mm -hmm. I think this has to be our, our final question, but again, I want you both to respond to it. In terms of this amazing project and this um, the amazing connections that happened, can you speak a little bit to how it was trauma-informed? And maybe we'll start with you, Crystal, to start us off with that. Can you just help people understand a little bit some of the ways in which you um, ensured that this was a trauma-informed project and intervention? The, yeah, the way we started off, first of all, was with a full day training on trauma and violence-informed practice. And everyone who was involved at the, in the project at that time attended from our knowledge keepers to our domestic violence advocates, research team members. So that was a really important piece of starting the project off in a good way. We also met periodically or regularly, I should say, with the whole team to discuss things that were coming up and ensure that we were delivering things in a way that was consistent with the values of being trauma and violence informed. 
and choice was really, really important. With all of the cultural and artistic activities, women had the option to do the beading project. They could do something else. They could participate in the research. All the questions were optional. So it was continually a process of ongoing consent. And the program was there for women to engage in so that it would help them so they could take as much or as little of that as as they wanted and we made sure to that all team members in the different communities were were sharing that aspect of of choice and support with the women okay lori would you care to add from your perspective as um facilitating and the direct work in the groups yeah, I have an interesting perspective of the trauma, being a frontline worker, seeing the trauma, working with these women. Um, I, I believe it's kind of common that people think that women experience trauma in their past and here they are coming to resolve that. But the thing is, especially for Indigenous women, trauma is ongoing. So their trauma is still happening as they're here in this group. Things are still happening in their community, um, in the province, in other provinces, as we're going through. There are some pretty significant things that happened for Indigenous communities while we were in this group. Um, things like the Colton Bushi murder and when that child came mm -hmm. out. We were in a group at that time and talked about that during our circle check. Talked about uh, missing and murdered Indigenous women. Some of our women within the group experienced some pretty traumatic events and we went through that together. So for us, it was constantly ongoing in the moment and we had to take those things as they come. And that's an important piece. It's not just talking about past trauma. Mm -hmm. Thank you both for your insights and for sharing this amazing um, project. And I hope your wish for broadening it so that it re reaches all members of the family, I hope that there's a way to do that um, and we'll watch. And we had a request that we just go back to your final slide because people want to see how to connect with you and are very interested in the manual that will be coming out around the program. And so if we could just go back to that slide, that would be wonderful. So that is how to connect with Lori and Crystal. So on behalf of the Knowledge Hub team and all of our participants, thank you very much, Lori and Crystal, and to the rest of the team that brought about this um, wonderful project. Thank you for sharing.